in today's class, what I want to do, we left off about um, halfway looking at the anti-effort mentality as the basic nature of the villains in Atlas Shrugged. Um, and I've condensed that material, and I'm going to try to get through that um, in, the, in the opening of the class. And then uh, the bulk of the class will be on looking at uh, the structure of part two of Galt's speech. So I've tried to, to structure the course so that we do about 50-50 um, looking at Galt's speech straight and looking at the connection of Galt's speech and Atlas. So uh, basically in the first class, we looked at the connection of the speech to, to the whole novel. The second class, we focused on part one of the speech. Yesterday, we looked mostly at uh, connections of points in the speech to um, scenes and events in Atlas. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, and so today we're going to be looking at part two, and then I hope uh, the last class will do about 50-50, um, the structure of part three, and also some discussion of some other scenes. So that will make it about 50-50 for the whole course. <clears throat> okay. Now, last time we made uh, the following points, that the state of focus, uh, which is the basic choice, requires effort in order to achieve it. And then we said that drift doesn't. Drift is a non-effortful state of mind. <clears throat> and then we said that anti-effort is really the same as a chronic drifter. <clears throat> and we said that that kind of mentality, which is the nature of the villains in Atlas, um, is sustained by evasion. And then we looked at some illustrations in Atlas with James Taggart, uh, with Lillian, and with Directive 10.289 about uh, just illustrating that that is the nature of the villains, that they're um, anti-effort. Now a couple of points that I forgot to make last time about evasion that I think uh, is necessary for where I'm going. Um, one is that evasion as contrast to drift is a state that requires effort. It's, it requires the expenditure of energy in order to lower your state of awareness. So you can look at um, James Taggart's mentality as, uh, and, and the whole anti-effort mentality as uh, effort for the sake of non-effort or action for the sake of non-action. <clears throat> So he, he evades in order to, to attain a state of drift. So he expends effort, energy, in order to get back to a state that doesn't require energy. Or he acts, uh, we're talking about mental action here, he evades in order to get to a state uh, of drift where mental action isn't required anymore. <clears throat> and you can see that that's one of the reasons why uh, the villains are on the death premise. <clears throat> Because they're on the premise of acting for the sake of not having to act anymore. Effort for the sake of non-effort. <clears throat> right? And the whole of life is action for the sake of more action. It's action to perpetuate more action. <clears throat> and a state of non-action or non-effort, a state of stillness, <clears throat> as Ayn Rand observed, is the antithesis of life. It's a state of death. And if that's what he's aiming at, then that's uh, one of the reasons he's on the standard of death. Now, a second point about evasion that uh, I skipped over, but I think we need. Um, this is a point that I got from Daryl Wright in his course on motivation by love versus motivation by fear. Um, and I, he discusses this point at length in his course. I'm just going to briefly mention it. Um, the idea that evasion is motivation by fear. <clears throat> and I think Darrow talks about that in general, about the nature of evasion in the course. Um, but I just want to look at it in the context of the anti-effort mentality, so James Taggart's mentality. <clears throat> um, you can look at Taggart's ideal, or his ultimate value. Um, I put it in quotes because it's an ideal or a value that has no basis in reality. 
But his ideal or value is the state of non-effort, a state of drift, a state where action or energy isn't required anymore. And every, um, <clears throat> every instance that requires of him to engage in mental action, that requires him or would require him to raise his level of awareness, is a disvalue for him. <clears throat> it's something he loathes, something he wants to escape. And evasion is his means of escaping. It's his means of pushing away, of pushing it away or running away from it. So if you think back to the, the opening scene uh, where James Taggart's introduced, which we talked about uh, yesterday, where um, someone's coming through his door and he says, don't bother me, don't bother me, don't bother me. And it's Eddie and he's announcing a problem on the Rio Norte line. <clears throat> well, that's a disvalue to him. Someone coming in, someone that, and a situation that might require him to get out of state of drift and raise his level of awareness. And as we talked about, he evades in that scene in order to keep drifting. <clears throat> so he's got this value, a state of non-effort, and he does everything he can when, he's, when he comes across a disvalue, which is something that requires him to think, which in the end is everything in reality is a disvalue to him. Um, he needs to escape it. So he's motivated by fear, by escaping uh, disvalues. And we need that point, um, uh, I'm going to connect that to, in, when we get to part two, at the very start of part two, um, Galt makes a point, this is on page 136, paragraph 89 of the speech. He makes the point that um, both the villains and the people in the world find that fear is the more practical incentive. So it's fear that will set a mind in motion, according to uh, the villains in Atlas Shrugged. And you can see that uh, most vividly, I think, in the torture scene with Galt, uh, that the, the villains think that fear and threats are, are what will get Galt to produce ideas. <clears throat> I think in the scene, Ferris says something like, ideas or else, or something like that. Um, and then they, they, all, they all echo something similar. Uh, when they're at the point of hysteria. <clears throat> so they think that fear and threats will produce mental action and mental ideas. <clears throat> so that's the point we're going to connect to at the end. Um, but we left off last time with, a, with the question of why choose um, the anti-effort mentality as the nature of the villains. What philosophical significance does the anti-effort mentality have? <clears throat> and, I, and I promised that what we'd look at is the, the prevalence and the dominance of this ideal in uh, the history of philosophy. <clears throat> now, I had, I had a whole bunch of different uh, philosophers we could look at. But let's, for the sake of time, let's take the big two uh, who are opposed to, to Ayn Rand. So Plato and Kant. And then we'll, we'll look at one of Kant's followers, a movement that's a Kantian pragmatism, because it, you get it most dramatically, I think, in pragmatism. <clears throat> okay, so let's take Plato first to see in what way, and we're going to do this quickly, to see in what way um, for him, anti-effort is an ideal. Well, this is, we get this from one of, uh, this is a quote from one of Plato's dialogues about what philosophy is for. And this is a quote. He says, those who really apply themselves in the right way to philosophy are directly and of their own accord preparing themselves for death and dying. <clears throat> so this is the idea um, that the whole of philosophy, the whole of your action on life, is a preparation for death, for inaction. <clears throat> now, of course, in, in Plato, this is, uh, this is combined with the idea that uh, in preparing yourself for death, you're going to reach the afterlife, and you're going to be, uh, your soul will be free from your body, and you'll get to uh, true reality. But what is Plato's image of true reality? <clears throat> 
Well, if you're familiar with Plato, um, his, ide his ideal is, and what he thinks true reality is, is a world of forms, as, as uh, Dr. Ridpat talked about in his uh, general lecture. It's a world of concepts, <clears throat> but it, it's, a, it's a static, abstract world. It's devoid of motion, change. Nothing ever happens there. It's eternal, but it's always the same. <clears throat> It's completely devoid of any kind of motion, action, change, effort. And that's what he thinks the ideal existence is like. <clears throat> so I think there's... Uh, Plato, there, there, there are, as always in all his aspects of his philosophy, there are counterbalancing tendencies, more pro-Greek tendencies in him. And, I mean, Greek culture was pro-life, pro-effort. But I think that's the uh, essence of... Plato's view, that he has this ideal of non-action, anti-effort. <clears throat> okay, now take Kant. Now, as you might expect, Kant's the arch-villain here. <clears throat> Though it's fairly well disguised, I think, the idea that uh, for him, anti-effort is the ideal. <clears throat> So, you know the idea that the essence of Kant is his view of consciousness. So, the idea that because human consciousness has an identity, that it has a nature, <clears throat> that it has specific means by which it tries to know reality, that it attempts to grasp existence, for that very reason, it can't grasp existence. It's blind because it has eyes, and death because it has ears. That's Ayn Rand's quote about the essence of Kant. <clears throat> So his idea is that the identity of consciousness invalidates consciousness and makes awareness of reality impossible. Then what kind of consciousness could grasp reality <clears throat> on Kant's view? And this you get explicitly in him. It. it would be a consciousness that uh, is nothing and that works know-how. <clears throat> it has no nature and it doesn't work in any specific means <clears throat> and yet it somehow knows reality. <clears throat> well, what does that really mean, if you want to uh, concretize that? Well, it's a consciousness that engages in no processing, no action, no work, no effort, and yet still knows reality. <clears throat> so Kant upholds as the ideal James Taggart's non-mind. <clears throat> That's the ideal mind. And he condemns the human mind because it falls short of Taggart's mind. <clears throat> so he condemns John Galt's mind because it fails to reach the ideal that is Taggart's. <clears throat> I think that's part of the reason Ayn Rand saw him as so evil. <clears throat> and notice, too, that uh, the flip side of Kant's view, if the ideal is non-effort, non-action, he also says that action necessarily means blindness, that any human processing or human effort in the mental realm means you're not aware of reality. It means you're blind. <clears throat> so that what Kant is really saying there is that consciousness by necessity evades. <clears throat> by its nature, it the only effort or action it's possible to it is evasion. Right? We talked about the idea that evasion is an effortful state. <clears throat> if Kant says that processing action means blindness, then all that's possible to a mind is evasion. So his, his view provides uh, the ability to for all evil men, and Taggart, you, you see this in various places in the book, to uh, rationalize and justify their evasion. Because they can say, I couldn't help it. <clears throat> and according to Kant's view, they couldn't. <clears throat> they had to, as, insofar as their mind does anything, it has to evade. And you get what's, what's more implicit in Kant, you get uh, explicit in pragmatism, which, which is a Kantian offshoot. And specifically in Dewey's pragmatism. Dewey has the idea that the, the ideal state of mind and state of existence is a state of ease, as they put it. It's a state where everything, for some reason, just works out. 
where the mind can operate by routine, on autopilot, just controlled by the subconscious. You kind of just can sit back and everything will work out. That's a state of ease. And the real meaning of that is that, that the, the ideal state of ease is a state of drift. It's a state of anti-effort. It's a state where the conscious mind isn't in control, but the subconscious mind is. And you just kind of coast along. You mentally coast along. <clears throat> but then Dewey says, and the pragmatists say, for some inexplicable reason, problems often crop up. And that's when you need uh, the need for thought, I mean, what they call thought. When you're in a state of dis-ease, <clears throat> And what you need thought for is to restore you to a state of ease. So what they're really calling thought is evasion. <clears throat> You've got this disvalue that's all of a sudden puts you out of your state of drift. <clears throat> and what you have to do is restore yourself to this state of drift. That's exactly James Taggart's mentality. <clears throat> I mean, it's a perfect description of the relation between drift and evasion, Dewey's image of the mind. And that's all that there is to the mind. There's what they call thought, which is evasion, and a state of drift. So thought's been pushed out of uh, the realm. I mean, there's no such thing as thought in their universe. <clears throat> and if you, I mean, if you realize that Dewey's been in control of the schools for decades, and his ideal, uh, the ideal state of mind for Dewey is James Taggart's state of mind. Um, I mean, it's little wonder that culture's in the mess it's in. <clears throat> so that's a bit on the way the, the anti-effort mentality has been so prevalent in the history of philosophy. Now, one, now let's connect this to what I said um, at, at the start of part two, the idea that uh, fear is the more practical incentive for a mind, that fear will set the mind in motion. <clears throat> well, I think it's not, I mean, this is one perspective on it. I think there are other reasons why uh, Galt says that in the speech, but this is one perspective on it. If you think of someone like James Taggart, well, what is his conception of a mind? <clears throat> Now, basically, your only act, your only primary access to a mind, to a consciousness, is your own. So you have to think of yourself as in James Taggart's consciousness. <clears throat> I mean, it's not a very nice uh, prospect, but uh, I mean, put yourself in his position. All he knows are two things: a state of drift and a state of evasion. His only conception of mental action or mental effort is evasion. That's his only idea of a mind in motion, of a mind doing something. It's evading. <clears throat> and as we talked about, evasion is motivation by fear. <clears throat> so when he wants to get someone else's consciousness in motion, when he wants to get, uh, when they're torturing Galt and they want him to produce ideas, what, it, what they think will work is fear, because that's the only idea they have of mental action. So they think threats and fear will get Galt's mind working. They have no conception of positive mental effort towards a genuine value or a genuine goal. <clears throat> so I think that's one uh, way of looking at what Galt says there at the start of Part two. Okay, that's basically what I wanted to say about the anti-effort mentality. So let me pause here for questions. Any questions? Sure. Uh, as I understand it in objectivism, fear is never a proper motivation for any action. Uh, and for my question is, for a fully rational man, is fear ever an emotion? Is fear an emotion? Yeah. Is it ever oh, yeah. an emotion for a fully rational man? I'm thinking of, of uh, Michelangelo's David, who represents uh, uh, a man con confronted by a powerful uh, threat. But his, his expression is certainly not one of fear. Uh, it's concern and focus. Well, and, I'm not going to... I mean, that, 
Yeah. That takes us a bit out of focus. But th I think definitely the fear is a, is a genuine emotion. And there are cases where there's a threat to your value uh, and you experience fear. I mean, if you're in a burning building or something like that, there's a threat to your life and you experience fear. And it's, it's, and it's, a, I mean, it's a necessary emotion to make you, uh, I mean, to draw your attention to the, the threat and uh, suggest the need for action, the need to run away, say, from a fire. Um, but, but motivation by fear, um, we're, it, you're, you're talking more motivation by escaping disvalues. And I think in the normal course of life, it's not a, a proper motivation. But there are uh, emergency situations, if you will, um, where you need to escape a disvalue. It's not a, it's, it should never be your primary orientation to escaping disvalues. But there are, often is the need to escape threats to your values. Um, and you can, Daryl goes in his, I mean, he has a whole course on this. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in the distinction, I'd suggest going to that. But I don't know if that helps. Do you want to follow up on that? or? Okay. Anything else? Uh, is it that the only forms of mental effort that James Hybert knew were drift and evasion? I was evasion. Sorry, or sorry, was evasion. I'd always sort of characterize that as a lack of mental effort. Is that, do you see that as actually sort of an active mental process or an effort? It's, it's, I think it's effortful. I'm not sure if I would describe it as an active mental yeah. process in, in the sense that uh, I mean, like a lot, like a process of thought is a long, drawn-out process, but it's definitely effortful for them to to try to lower their state of awareness, and when they rationalize to do that or something like that, I think there's definitely mental effort to, to do that. <clears throat> Pardon? Yeah, it's not just your senses, but. I mean, when he real, I mean, when his mind suggests the need, when he gets signals for the need for thought, he needs to push those out of mind. Anything else? <clears throat> okay, well, let's go then to start out in the structure of part two. So as I s I've said, I think the, the structure of the part two runs from pages 136, paragraph 89, all the way to um, 163, paragraph 206. <clears throat> and then this is a lot of material that uh, I'm, we're going to try to condense into about 50 minutes. So, um, <clears throat> so we'll have to go fairly quickly. Um, and what's what's interesting about, or one of the things that's interesting about the structure of part two, that uh, it's not obvious, but when you realize it, it makes the, the structure of part two much easier to grasp, um, is that if you look at the, the outline of the structure on the back of, of my handout, <clears throat> um, the, the structure of part two parallels the structure of part one. So the, the presentation of the morality of death parallels the, the, the general topics made in the presentation of the morality of life. <clears throat> and as we go through the structure of part two, I want to try to highlight that aspect that we're getting. Um, <clears throat> it, it, we've got this kind of mirroring structure. Okay, so the, the first, what I have is the first part, uh, sorry, the first section of part two is the damning of man's nature as evil. <clears throat> that runs from pages 136 to 138, paragraphs 89 to 102. <clears throat> and just as part one began with man's metaphysical nature, right, it began with the idea that reason is man's tool of survival, that it functions volitionally, that man is a living being. 
and that that morality consists in in embracing your metaphysical nature right we we looked at the idea that uh man has to be man by choice which is in uh section a of part 1 <clears throat> well here we get the morality of death's uh view i mean if you can elevate it to that of man's metaphysical nature <clears throat> And it's really the rewriting of man's metaphysical nature. <clears throat> so Galt says in, uh, this is page 136, paragraph 91, your code begins by damning man as evil. <clears throat> now if you, uh, you might recall in part one in the section on the axioms, um, at the end of the discussion of identity, um, Galt says that the purpose of those who attack or deny the law of identity is to make you forget that man is man. <clears throat> and you see part of the caching in here, uh, because that's what they're doing in the start of their, uh, of launching the morality of death, that they're rewriting the nature of man. <clears throat> so, so they look at man's nature and they have a negative evaluation of it and they condemn him for his nature. <clears throat> and they condemn him um, because their ideal is the anti-effort mentality. <clears throat> so I want to quote uh, a couple of paragraphs here. This is, I find, one of the most chilling uh, sections of Galt's speech. This is on, um, so, so we've got the idea that they begin by damning man's nature. And he says, that the name of this monstrous absurdity is original sin. Now, I think you need to see original sin as wider than just religion. It's the whole anti-effort mentality. And that's part of why I wanted to uh, just sketch the, the predominance of that idea in the history of philosophy. So you need to see it wider here than just religion. It's definitely <clears throat> a wider perspective in the speech. And this is what he says about uh, original sin. This is on page... 137, paragraph 96. <clears throat> what is the nature of the guilt that your teachers call his original sin? What are the evils man acquired when he fell from a state they considered perfection? Their myth declares that he ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He acquired a mind and became a rational being. It was the knowledge of good and evil. He became a moral being. He was sentenced to earn his bread by his labor. He became a productive being. He was sentenced to experience desire. He acquired the capacity for sexual enjoyment. The evils for which they damn him are reason, morality, creativeness, joy, all the cardinal values of his existence. It is not his vices that their myth of man's fall is designed, is designed to explain and condemn. It is not his errors that they hold as his guilt, but the essence of his nature as man. Whatever he was, that robot in the Garden of Eden, who existed without mind, without values, without labor, without love. He was not man. Man's fall, according to your teachers, was that he gained the virtues required to live. These virtues, by their standard, are his sin. His evil, they charge, is that he's a man. <clears throat> his guilt, they charge, is that he lives. They call it a morality of mercy and a doctrine of love for man. <clears throat> So they begin by uh, condemning man's nature as evil. <clears throat> I'm saying that man is what he should not be. <clears throat> and now notice um, that that's the, the beginning idea of the morality of death. And what is the... Um, what is the price of entrance into the morality of death? What do you have to do in order to uh, walk through the gates and enter the morality of death? <clears throat> what you have to do is surrender your mind. <clears throat> you have to give up your mind. <clears throat> As Galt puts it, <clears throat> this is uh, page 136, uh, paragraph 91. He says, it demands as his first proof of virtue 
<clears throat> that he accept his own depravity without proof. <clears throat> so his first proof of virtue is that he accept his own depravity without guilt. <clears throat> so he has to accept the unintelligible idea that he's evil because he exists, that he's evil because he is a man. <clears throat> I think that's an important idea that Galt comes back to later in the speech, that that's the initial price to enter the morality of death, that you surrender your mind, that you have to accept an unintelligible idea. <clears throat> and notice the, the whole start of the morality of death is a concentrated attack on the mind. Because another point is that, so your basic choice in entering the morality of death is either to stay on the side of reason or to, ex to surrender reason and accept an unintelligible, inexplicable idea. So that's your basic choice. <clears throat> But the idea of original sin is aimed at attacking your very concept of reason and your hold on reality. <clears throat> because I think the idea here in the speech, I think, is that once you enter the morality of death, they don't want you to be able to exit. <clears throat> sure. Entering, you know, exiting the of death. Uh, I mean, accepting it or choosing, uh, choosing it as your code. Uh, <clears throat> So I think to, to, to accept it to, 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 and, and be willing to practice it, you have to, the idea is that you have to surrender your mind. It's your first proof of virtue to discard your mind. <clears throat> and I think uh, the idea in the speech is that that's your basic choice, but they're going to try to make you forget that that was your choice. And so <clears throat> you won't be able to go back. They're kind of, you won't, they're, they're knocking off the ladder by which you, got uh, to the morality of death. So um, this is what he says about what the, the concept of original sin does to you. He says, <clears throat> this is uh, page 137, uh, paragraph 94. He says, to hold this man's sin, a fact not open to his choice, is a mockery of morality. To hold man's nature as a sin is a mockery of nature. To punish him for a crime he committed before he was born is a mockery of justice. To hold him guilty in a matter where no innocent, innocence exists is a mockery of reason. <clears throat> to destroy morality, nature, justice, and reason by means of a single concept is a feat of evil hardly to be matched. Yet that is the root of your code. <clears throat> And I think it's a similar idea when we get later in this section, the distinction between soul-body. So we get the soul-body dichotomy. <clears throat> and he says that that doctrine is designed to ignore a faculty, namely your mind. And I think those words are chosen deliberately, that it's designed to ignore <clears throat> And I think what that means, that it's designed to ignore, is that you see your choice now not as reason versus accepting an unintelligible idea of original sin, but you see your choices while well, siding with the soul or siding with the body. And both those uh, two, two sides of the dichotomy are unintelligible. <clears throat> the idea of a soul without a body or a body without a soul. And they're both, as uh, Galt points out, symbols of death. <clears throat> so now your choice really is death behind door number one or death behind door number two. <clears throat> and they've pushed out the idea that you could choose reason, you could choose the side of life. <clears throat> so I think, you could, as you could see, the, the first section of part one um, as a uh, embracing man's metaphysical nature and saying that the task of morality is to teach you how to be a man and live. Um, the section A of part two on the damning of man's nature is evil is uh, morality is to teach you how to be a non-man and die. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so that's what I have for the first section of the morality of death. Any questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> now, the second section in uh, the first part was defining the, the standards, the overall principle of the morality of life and its purpose. So it was man's life as the standard and your own life as the purpose of morality. <clears throat> now, I think the next section in, in, in uh, part two on the morality of death is giving us the standard and purpose of morality according to uh, the two teachers of the morality of death, so the mystics of spirit and the mystics of muscle. <clears throat> so we're getting their, their version of the standard of value and the purpose of morality, their view of uh, good and evil. <clears throat> And I'm, I'm not going to discuss the distinction between the mystics of spirit and the mystics of muscle. I think that's familiar. And I think a theme throughout the speech is that, though uh, superficially different, they're fundamentally the same. So, <clears throat> but this this is in uh, in on page 139, paragraph 105. We get uh, the standard of values for the mystics of spirit and the mystics of muscle, and then the purpose of morality for uh, both of them. So to quote from uh, 139, paragraph 105, uh, Galt says, quote, Man's standard of value, say the mystics of spirit, is the pleasure of God, whose standards are beyond man's power of comprehension and must be accepted on faith. <clears throat> man's standard of value, say the mystics of muscle, is the pleasure of society, whose standards are beyond man's right of judgment and must be obeyed as a primary absolute. <clears throat> the purpose of man's life, say both, is to become an abject zombie who serves a purpose he does not know for reasons he is not to question. <clears throat> so we've got their version of the standard of value <clears throat> that, that's contrasting to, uh, in part one, man's life as the standard of value. And we've kind of got the purpose uh, that they say morality serves. But <clears throat> notice it's not defined here. It's, it was uh, to become an abject zombie who serves a purpose he does not know for reasons he is not to question. <clears throat> All he knows is that selfishness, concern with his self, is evil, and that sacrifice, self-sacrifice, is good. But he doesn't really know what purpose he's acting for. And I think that's what we get in the next section, that the purpose is hidden, and you have to uncover. It's not openly stated what the purpose is. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to turn to the next section. If there are not any, uh, let me pause again on section B. Any questions uh, before moving on? Okay, well, let's go to section C then, which I've entitled The Meaning of sacrifice. <clears throat> and that goes from pages 139 to 143, uh, paragraphs 107 to 124. <clears throat> and what I think, what we get here is the, the hidden purpose uh, for the morality of death. <clears throat> so if you think in terms of a parallel again to the structure of part one, I don't I mean, this has a parallel, and it doesn't have a parallel. It, for the morality of life, we got the purpose, which was to live your life and to achieve your own happiness. And it's openly stated. And here we're uncovering, Galt is uncovering the, the morality of death's hidden purpose. So it's, it's kind of a continuation of part B. So there, there's a parallel, and there isn't, because one for one, the purpose is hidden, and for one, it isn't. <clears throat> Now, what would you say if you were asked, what is the hidden purpose of the code of sacrifice? Or what is the purpose of this? I mean, it's hidden by the preachers of the morality of death. But what is the purpose of the code of sacrifice? <clears throat> Why would you say that? 
that's what it ultimately ends up doing. Yeah. You can't just tell somebody to do that. So it's hidden. Um, I think that's the it's the um, it, it, that's the ultimate purpose of the the preachers of the morality of death is uh, to kill to kill everything. I mean, it's it's hatred of the good for being the good. But I think that we get a little different focus here on what the the, the purpose of sacrifice. Why would they want people to sacrifice their values for others? <clears throat> Yeah. They would, they would, if they sacrifice their values for others, then that means they give up their values. Okay, and who are they sacrificing to? Is it to just anybody? Well, that's the, I mean, that's the alleged uh, what you're doing, that you're sacrificing for to them, yeah, it's to them, but it's too, it's too evil. <clears throat> it's sacrifice. It's not just sacrificing your material, material and spiritual values to others, but it's specifically to evil. <clears throat> if if you look at the um, end of this section on one forty three, or sorry, on, on one, not right at the end, one forty two, paragraph uh, one twenty one. <clears throat> He says uh, at the at the end of 121, he says, "Renounce the material world and you surrender it to evil, and that and that is italicized is precisely the goal of your morality, the duty that your code demands of you." <clears throat> so the the hidden purpose of sacrifice is not just for Reardon to give up his values, but specifically to, for Reardon to give up uh, the values he produces to uh, those he regards as evil and loathsome. <clears throat> he has to be, uh, they have to convince the producers, the people who produce values, to sacrifice them to that which they hate, that which they despise. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is uh, on page 141 of the speech. G quote, uh, paragraph 119, sorry. Um, quote, are you thinking in some foggy stupor that it's only material values that your morality requires you to sacrifice? And what do you think are material values? Matter has no value except as a means for the satisfaction of human desires. Matter is only a tool of human values. To what service are you asked to give the material tools your virtue has produced? To the service of that which you regard as evil to a principle you do not share, to a person you do not respect, to the achievement of a purpose opposed to your own, else your gift is not a sacrifice. <clears throat> and the start of 120, the paragraph 120, your morality tells you to renounce the material world and to divorce your values from matter. <clears throat> and you can, you can get... Um, Two, let's take two contrasting situations from Atlas to try to uh, illustrate the difference. Um, now, I'm taking Reardon here. Uh, so it's not, you, you can't, the, as I said, the speech is addressed to the semi-rational. And um, I don't have an example of that. I have an example of a, of a rational person, Reardon. But I think it, you get the idea of what the difference is and what sacrifice is driving at. Um, and, and the difference when Gaul, between a gift and a sac, what Gaul calls a gift and a sacrifice. <clears throat> um, if you remember, there's a there's a scene towards the first uh, I don't know third of the book between Reardon and Mr. Ward from uh, Minnesota, and he's come to Reardon trying to get some uh, steel for his plant, and he knows that Reardon's at full capacity. So he's looking for a favor for a gift, uh, and this is this is part from the scene. <clears throat> this is Ward talking. He says, "I know that your mills are running at capacity, Mr. Reardon." He said, "And I know that you are not in a position to take care of new orders. What with your biggest, oldest customers having to wait their turn, you're being the only decent—I mean, reliable—steel manufacturer left in the country. 
I don't know what reason to offer you as to why you should want to make an exception in my case. <clears throat> but there was nothing else for me to do except close the doors of my plant for good, and I, there was a slight break in his voice. I can't quite see my way to closing the doors as yet. So I thought I'd speak to you, even if I didn't have much of a, a chance. Still, I had to try everything possible. <clears throat> this was language Reardon could understand. <clears throat> I wish I could help you out, he said. But this is, the, this is the worst possible time for me, because of a very large, very special order that takes precedence over everything else. Uh, everything else. <clears throat> so if, if Reardon was to, were to help him out, it would be a gift. It would be a favor <clears throat> to him. Because he shares, as it's put, uh, this was language that Reardon could understand. He shares the same standards. <clears throat> and that's not what they need for sacrifice, that you sacrifice, that Reardon would sacrifice to Mr. Ward and do him a favor and give him some steel that he couldn't afford to give him. <clears throat> they need to Reardon to sacrifice to what he regards as evil, <clears throat> to what he loathes, because he'll, he'll loathe an anti-effort, uh, non-purposeful mind like a James Taggart's or a Phillips. <clears throat> and we see that in uh, very close to the opening, um, on page, these are, these are 46, 47. We see Reardon, um, in effect, I mean, he, he, he doesn't know that this is what he's doing, but sacrificing f to evil, to what he regards with contempt. When he gives, uh, if you remember the scene where uh, Philip wants money for the friends of global progress, <clears throat> and Reardon dislikes Philip, and he feels contempt for the project, for this, this organization, Friends of Global Progress. And yet he gives them money anyway. <clears throat> and that's the essence of what they're after and what they need and the, the hidden purpose of sacrifice. It's the sacrifice to evil. <clears throat> so to read a little bit from that scene. <clears throat> this is reared in thinking about Philip. He said, this is on 46. There was something wrong by Reardon standards with a man who did not seek any gainful employment, but he would not impose his standards on Philip. <clears throat> and then this is uh, Philip talking. I'm trying to raise money for friends of global progress. Reardon had never been able to keep track of the many organizations to which Philip belonged, nor to get a clear idea of their activities. He had heard Philip talking vaguely about this one for the last six months. It seemed, to, it seemed to, to be devoted to some sort of free lectures on psychology, folk music, and cooperative farming. Reardon felt contempt for groups of that kind and saw no reason for closer inquiry into, the nature, <clears throat> into their nature. And yet he gives them money anyway. <clears throat> That's the hidden purpose, and that's in, in part um, when Reardon liberates himself from um, his mistaken premises. He realizes that one of his uh, most fundamental mistakes was to grant uh, uh, value or, or terms to that which uh, were not his standards, not his values. <clears throat> so uh, this is towards the end uh, when Reardon... Um, this is the last scene with uh, Reardon and his family. And you see uh, now a completely uh, opposite view on Reardon's part to his family versus the opening. Um, <clears throat> this is Reardon to his family. Uh, this is on page 892. What is it you want me to do, he asked, in the clear, flat tone of a business conference. I don't know. Who am I to know? This is his mother. I don't know. Who am I to know? That's not what I'm talking of right now. Not of doing only a feeling. It's your feeling that I'm begging you for, Henry. Just your feeling. Even if, even if we don't deserve it. You're, you're generous and strong. You will cancel the past, Henry. Will you forgive us? <clears throat> the look of terror in her eyes was real. A year ago, he would have told himself that this was her way of making amends. He would have choked his revulsion against her words. <clears throat> words which conveyed nothing to him but the fog of the meaningless. He would have violated his mind to give them meaning, even if he did not understand. He would have, ascri he would have ascribed to her virt the virtue of sincerity in her own terms, 
even if they were not his. But he was through granting respect to any terms but his own. <clears throat> and that's, I think, part of a, a significant part of Reardon uh, stopping to sanction evil and to stop sacrificing uh, to evil. <clears throat> okay, that's on. That's all I have for section C on the the, the meaning of sacrifice and the, the hidden purpose that uh, the Nate that Galt's discussion of the nature of sacrifice gets to. So, any questions before we move uh, to the next section? <clears throat> okay. Well, let's move to uh, section D. which I call the guidance offered by the code of sacrifice. <clears throat> and now again, let's start off with the, the looking at the parallel between parts one and part two. <clears throat> now I think we do have a parallel except for a couple of things. Um, part one went from the standard and purpose to the philosophical foundation of the morality of life. And we saw there we got the, the most condensed essence of the code of life and what its uh, guidance is. And we don't have a parallel, I don't think, to that uh, part of the speech here. We, there's a, a rough par parallel to it at the end of section B, <clears throat> when we get to uh, the means and motives of the, the preachers of the morality of death. And I think the reason there's not a section on the deeper philosophical foundation is because it doesn't have one. It doesn't have a deeper foundation in truths. It has a deeper foundation in uh, even more corruption. But that will come at the end when he gets to uh, the, the mentality of those who advocate and preach the morality of death. <clears throat> so I think this, you don't get that parallel, but you get the guidance offered by the code of sacrifice, and that's a parallel to the next section in part uh, <clears throat> part one, <clears throat> uh, where, where, where you got the guidance, the values, virtues, and reward offered by the morality of life. So this section begins um, on page 143, paragraph 125. It starts off, if you search your code for guidance, for an answer to the question, what is the good, <clears throat> the only answer you will find is the good of others. <clears throat> so what we're looking for here is an actual positive guidance from the code, not about what's evil and has to be negated, but is there anything good and is there anything to be pursued? <clears throat> and what, they, what the, their so-called guidance is, is that it's the good of others. <clears throat> And the point here, I think, is that that's no guidance at all, <clears throat> to, to continue in that paragraph. Uh, so he says, the only answer you will find is the good of others. The good is whatever others wish, whatever you feel they feel, whatever you feel they feel they wish, or whatever you feel they ought to feel. The good of others is a magic formula that transforms anything into gold, a formula to be recited as a guarantee of moral glory, and as a fumigator for any action even the slaughter of a continent. <clears throat> Your standard of virtue is not an object, not an act, not a principle, but an intention. You need no proof, no reasons, no success. You need not achieve, in fact, the good of others. All you need to know is that your motive was the good of others, not your own. Your only definition of the good is a negation. The good is the non-good for me. <clears throat> Now, I think that this is a really important paragraph. <clears throat> On the one hand, you get the idea that they have no positive conception of the good. The good is the good for others. So my good is your good. Your good is the next person's good. And it goes on, and it's a, just a string of zeros. <clears throat> There's no identity to uh, what the good is. I mean, it's a similar point to the idea of the public good is a non-objective concept, and there's no way to define it, <clears throat> no way to uh, reach it, no way for it to be achieved. 
But we're, we're getting the, I think in this paragraph, you get the flip side of that. <clears throat> if there's no way for it to be achieved, there's also no way for someone to tell you you're not headed towards it. <clears throat> they can't, they can, you can never say to someone who uh, is so-called, is, I mean, who says he's pursuing the good of others, that, well, you're doing the wrong thing and you're not heading towards the good of others. <clears throat> Because there's no objective endpoint that you can say, well, look, this is what you're trying to reach, and you're doing the wrong things, so you're not going to reach it. Because there is no such endpoint. <clears throat> so, so long as they can, they have, as, as, if you notice, uh, intention is italicized in this paragraph. So long as their intention is not their own good, anything goes. <clears throat> and there's no criticism you can make of, of what they're doing. <clears throat> I think that that's a, a profound point about why, uh, I mean, if you think of the 20th century and the blood pouring from continents because of the cold of sacrifice, and there, everyone remains unfazed um, because you can't tell them, well, look, you're not, you're not headed towards uh, the good of others. <clears throat> So it, what it's, I mean, it's so-called uh, upfront guidance is no guidance at all. It gives, it tells you nothing about what to do. <clears throat> all it tells you is that your intention should not uh, be towards yourself. <clears throat> but there's hidden guidance to the code. <clears throat> and that's what we get in uh, the remainder of the section. <clears throat> So Galt asks questions that they're not prepared to ask about what their code has to tell them. This is um, page 144, paragraph 130. <clears throat> he says, I who do not accept the unearned, neither in values nor in guilt, am here to ask the questions you evaded. Why is it moral to serve the happiness of others, but not your own? <clears throat> if enjoyment is a value, why is it moral when experienced by others? but immoral when experienced by you. If a sensation of eating a cake is a value, why is it immoral indulgence in your stomach, but a moral goal for you to achieve in the stomach of others? <clears throat> and Galt goes on uh, in that paragraph asking similar questions. <clears throat> and then he says in, in 131, he says, The answer you evade, the monstrous answer, is, No, the takers are not evil, provided they did not earn the value you gave them. It is not immoral for them to accept it, provided they are unable to produce it, unable to deserve it, unable to give you any value in return. It is not immoral for them to enjoy it, provided they did not obtain it by right. <clears throat> and as in, in the next paragraph, midway through, he says, it is the parasites who are the moral just justification for the existence of the producers, but the existence of the parasites is an end in itself. <clears throat> And so it's hidden guidance, it's monstrous hidden guidance of how you get to the moral elite, as Gall puts it uh, in the next paragraph, is to reach a state of lack of value. That's what it tells you, uh, that's its hidden guidance, to uh, achieve a state of lacking all that value. And the way to get rewards, as he puts it, uh, this is paragraph uh, 136 on page 145. To demand rewards for your virtue is selfish and immoral. It is your lack of virtue that transforms your demand into a moral right. <clears throat> and so the, the, the hidden guidance of the code is to become a zero. <clears throat> and that's what we get at the end of this section. He says, a morality that holds need as a claim holds emptiness, non-existence as its standard of value. It rewards an absence, a defect, weakness, inability, incompetence, suffering, disease, disaster, the lack, the fault, the flaw, the zero. <clears throat> and that's its guidance, become a zero. <clears throat> okay, any questions on that section? <clears throat> and we're going pretty quickly here. Uh, I hope to get through part two today.
Okay, well, let's turn. These last two sections are brief. Just as in uh, and this next section I call the Code of Sacrifices Implications for Dealing with Others. <clears throat> so just as in part one, after we got the essence of the, the guidance that the morality of life offers, its values, virtues, and reward, we got its basic moral implications for dealing with others, right? We have the trader principle, you deal by your mind and with other people's mind, and you don't initiate force. <clears throat> now we get, uh, I mean, to the extent that you can call it guidance, we get what the, the code of sacrifice, the morality of death, has to say about your dealings with others. <clears throat> and basically it has no guidance to offer. <clears throat> what it has to tell you is that you live in a cannibal's world. <clears throat> And it's a war of all against all. <clears throat> it's like Hobbes' state of nature, which he called solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. <clears throat> you have to cannibalize the men uh, who do produce values and destroy them. <clears throat> you feel only loathing uh, for your own self, because as Galt puts it, you have to adopt uh, one of two roles, the role of a sucker or a beggar. So you're a sucker if you produce values because someone's just going to demand them. Someone who, who, who's achieved the state of lack of value will just take your values away. So you're a sucker for producing them. <clears throat> and if you achieve the state of lack of value, then you're a beggar who has to go around begging people uh, <clears throat> for their values. And so, I mean, those are two low... I mean, to be a sucker or a beggar are uh, not very appealing states. <clears throat> so it produces self-loathing in you and it produces uh, fear and hatred of other people. As Galt puts it, this is uh, page 146, paragraph 140. You fear the man who has a dollar less than, less than you. That dollar is rightfully his. He makes you feel like a moral defrauder. <clears throat> you hate the man who has a dollar more than you. That dollar is rightfully yours. He makes you feel that you are morally defrauded. <clears throat> the man below is a source of guilt. The man above is a source of your frustration. <clears throat> so you hate and fear both the people above you and the people below you. So basically you hate and fear everybody. It's a war of all against all. <clears throat> So it has no guidance to offer in the dealing with others. It's just always chaos. <clears throat> okay, that's what I have on that section. Any questions about that? <clears throat> okay, the, this la there's a last brief section um, before we get to the teachers of the morality of death. And this I section I don't think has a counterpart in part one, and I call this the uh, justification of the code of sacrifice. And basically the point is that uh, Galt's making um, is that the, 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 the justification for the code of sacrifice is even more corrupt uh, than the code itself. <clears throat> Let me just, uh, I don't have much to say on this, let me just read to you uh, a couple of quotes from this section to get an idea of <clears throat> what I think this section is telling you. Um, this is from 146, paragraph 141, the start of this section, I think. He says, The justification of sacrifice that your mor morality propounds is more corrupt than the corruption it purports to justify. The motive of your sacrifice, it tells you, should be love, the love you ought to feel for every man. <clears throat> and then towards the end of this section, he says, You owe your love, this is uh, page 147, paragraph 144. He says, quote, you owe your love to those who don't deserve it, and the less they deserve it, the more you, you love you owe them. The more loathsome the object, the nobler your love. The more unfastidious your love, the greater your virtue. And if you can bring your soul to the state of a dump heap that welcomes anything on equal terms, if you can cease to value moral values, you have achieved the state of moral perfection. <clears throat> I mean, and is it any wonder that if that's the code that's been uh, achieved in the world through Galt's strike, that the result is destruction and death 
And so God says, this is uh, page 144, paragraph 146, he says, no, that's not page. Sorry, 148, paragraph 147. <clears throat> he says, such was your goal and you've reached it. Why do you now moan complaints about man's impotence and the futility of human aspirations? Because you are unable to prosper by seeking destruction. Because you are unable to find joy by worshipping pain. Because you are unable to live by holding death as your standard of value. <clears throat> and I think that's the end of the presentation of the morality of life. <clears throat> and the next section then... Uh, the last section of part two is to look at teachers of the morality of life. So look at, this is the transition, this is again 148, paragraph 147. He says, the degree of your ability to live was the, the, the degree to which you broke your moral code. Yet you believe that those who preach it are friends of humanity. You damn yourself and dare not question their motives or their goals. Take a look at them now when you face your last choice. And if you choose to perish, do so with full knowledge of how cheaply, how small an enemy has claimed your life. <clears throat> and I think from then on, then to the, to the end of this section, which um, is, a, is a long uh, section, is looking at the um, teachers, the preachers of the morality of death. Now, this, this I think is the most, this, the next uh, about 10 pages, I think are the most difficult part of Galt's speech. Um, let's see if we can just, uh, I mean, you can look at my structure uh, that I've set out in the handout of part two. Let's just look at uh, the, the, opening of it and then um, we'll be able to take up the closing hopefully quickly at the start of tomorrow's class. <clears throat> so we, I, I pointed out um, at, at the start of the discussion of the morality of death that he said uh, that I, I thought one of the key ideas was the idea that you had to surrender your mind in order to accept the morality of death, that to accept the idea of original sin, that man is guilty by the mere fact of existing, um, <clears throat> that, you, that that's accepting an unintelligible idea. And so it's, it's surrendering your reason. <clears throat> and I think now the, the first point uh, in this uh, last section is that that's how the mystic attack you, that they attack you through fear of relying on your mind. <clears throat> so if, 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 if as I said before, that the price of admission to the morality of death is your mind, <clears throat> then what the mystics try to do is to convince you that the price is not a very high price. <clears throat> Indeed, they try to convince you that you're getting a bargain. <clears throat> if they can convince you that your mind is useless, that it's impotent, then what's the big deal if the price of admission is giving up your mind, is giving up this impotent useless thing. <clears throat> because look what you're getting in return. You're getting these potent revelations of the mystic. And all you're giving up is something that doesn't work. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I think um, this is on 148. He says, uh, this is page 148, paragraph 148. The mystics of both schools who preach the creed of sacrifice are germs that attack you through a single sore, your fear of relying on your mind. <clears throat> they tell you that they possess a means of knowledge higher than the mind, a mode of consciousness superior to reason, like a special pull with some bureaucrat of the universe who gives them secret tips withheld from others. The mystics of spirit declare that they possess an extra, extra sense you lack, this special sixth sense consists of contradicting the whole of the knowledge of your five. The mystics of muscle do not bother to assert any claim to extrasensory perception. They merely declare that your senses are not valid and that the, and their wisdom consists of perceiving your blindness by some manner of unspecified means. 
Both kinds demand that you invalidate your own consciousness and surrender yourself into their power. They offer you as proof of their superior knowledge the fact that they assert the opposite of everything you know, and as proof of the, their superior ability to deal with existence, the fact that they lead you to misery, self-sacrifice, starvation, destruction. <clears throat> and, it, and, and it goes on how they claim a superior mode of existence and so on. So I think the idea is that all the, the attacks on the validity of senses, on logic, on reason, on consciousness, on identity, on existence, are for the purpose of softening you, softening you up um, to, to, to be ready to enter the morality of death, that you will be ready to give up your mind <clears throat> and so uh, enter the morality of death. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay, let's take up one last point. I think this is uh, an important point in um, this last section. That the, their ideal, we get a deeper look at the ideal of the mystics. We had it at the start in the idea of the Garden of Eden. And now we get, um, and we said that that's the, the anti-effort mentality. Now we get a deeper look at that uh, same idea of why and of why they preach the morality of death. That their ideal, as I put it, is a world where wishing works. <clears throat> and, and, and you can see, uh, this is on 151, uh, you can see the parallel to the Garden of Eden. Sorry, it's on 149. He says, uh, this is paragraph 151. On this material, profit-chasing earth, an enormous investment of virtue, of intelligence, integrity, energy, skill, is required to construct a railroad to carry them the distance of one mile. In their non-material, non-profit world, they travel from planet to planet at the cost of a wish. If an honest person asks them how, they answer with righteous scorn that a how is, a con is the concept of vulgar realist, the concept of superior spirits somehow. On this earth restricted by matter and profit, rewards are achieved by thought. In a world set free of such restrictions, rewards are re achieved by wishing. And that is the whole of their shabby secret, the secret of all their esoteric philosophies, of all their dialectics and super senses, of their evasive eyes and snarling words, the secret for which they destroy civilization, language, industry, and lives, the secret for which they pierce their own eyes and eardrums, grind out their senses, blank out their minds, the purpose for which they dissolve the absolutes of reason, logic, matter, existence, reality, is to erect upon that plastic fog a single holy absolute, their wish. <clears throat> and now I hope um, tomorrow, to, in the discussion, I hope to get to a discussion of the sanction of the victim. And this is a key uh, idea, I think, in the sanction of the victim. And we see Reardon grasping this um, as his kind of final grasp of what it is, uh, of how he's been servicing evil inadvertently. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, I mean, as Galt says, it's the key to their secret. And it's, and it's the, the key that Reardon grasps and sets him free. Um, okay, we're out of time. I hope to... I'm going to try to condense getting through part two for tomorrow's class. Um, and then, as I said, we'll get part three, which I think we can do quickly. And I hope to take up some other topics in Atlas, too.